My family in Christ, how much time do you spend paying attention to the news? Do you like to read the newspaper or articles online? Do you watch a lot of news on TV, maybe the nightly news? If you're not paying attention to any news at all, you'll remember that somebody who usually gives the news has been in the news a lot lately. That's NBC's Brian Williams. Uh, Brian Williams, a very well-respected reporter for a long time, has recently taken a lot of heat uh, for making, making a false claim. He claimed that he was in a wartime situation on a helicopter when it took fire, and that he was there for the whole thing. And as he reported that, it came out from soldiers who were on the helicopter that they didn't remember Brian being there. I wonder, why did he do that? Why did he make it sound like he was there during that, during that struggle, during that hardship? Who knows, maybe it was to make himself look like he could relate more to the war struggle, or maybe to make himself look like a tougher reporter. It's, it's hard to say. But what's happened is that now everybody's perception of him has changed a lot. The soldiers and overall veterans in general, when they heard his apology, they weren't really buying it. Kind of felt like maybe he was trying to cheapen their struggle at war. Trying to be a part of it in a way that he just wasn't, that he couldn't understand. A lot of people have lost respect for Brian. And maybe uh, Brian Williams was trying to make himself look better, but in the end, he just ended up losing his credibility. Now, Generally speaking, people tend to exaggerate things pretty often, right? Uh, there's the classic fisherman who exaggerates his struggle with the fish and how big it was. Uh, there's maybe the classic, classic exaggeration of, did you really work out that hard at the gym today? Uh, there's all sorts of struggles that we exaggerate about, generally to try to make ourselves look better. Well, Brian Williams, uh, he wasn't just a man exaggerating about something. He's, he's a news anchor. He's a reporter of the news. He's supposed to report facts. Now he can't be trusted. Now people think that he doesn't take war struggles seriously, that he doesn't take the news seriously because he lied. That's maybe something we have to look within ourselves about, too. Is, do we sometimes lie about our own struggles? Especially our struggle with sin. That's a really dangerous struggle to lie about. It's dangerous to exaggerate your struggle with sin, to exaggerate the way maybe that you handle it. To try to say that you're better at it than you really are. It's dangerous to try to make your struggle with sin not seem as dangerous as it really is. So what you're doing is you're lying to yourself putting herself in a really hurtful situation, a potentially very dangerous situation. And God doesn't want that for you. Instead, he wants you to be honest with yourself, honest with the struggle that you face, honest about the struggles that you have with temptations, then, then maybe you aren't perfect. And then if you realize you aren't perfect, that, that the struggle isn't left up to you. We remember that our struggle is already taken on by somebody else. It's taken on by our Savior. Today we're going to get to look at a very special occasion where Jesus took on that struggle in a very real way, in a very visceral way that's uh, it's very striking. We see the struggle that he went through, the struggle that he went through for us. Because his struggle ends differently than, what our struggles, than how our struggles usually end. That's a good thing for us, because we get to enjoy relief in the struggle that Jesus went through. So we're going to turn to Mark chapter 1 today. We're going to look at the struggle Jesus went through in the desert, a struggle that happened right after he was baptized, which is a really glorious moment. The heavens opened up, and God looked down on Jesus and said, I, You are my son, with whom I am well pleased. But right after that glorious moment, Jesus went out went through a very unglorious struggle. We're going to look at that now in Mark chapter 1. So if you can please follow along. 
and read Mark chapter 1, verses 12 through 15, and look at this struggle that Jesus went through on our behalf. And once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. And after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This is the word of God. Maybe some of you remember an incident that happened uh, just a couple, couple years ago, maybe three years ago now. An incident that solidified my fears of the open water. Uh, it was a cruise ship in the Gulf of Mexico, a carnival cruise ship that had a fire come out in the engine room and cut all their power. And this was a really big cruise ship, 4,000 plus people on it. And they were without power for five days. And that means being without power, they had to have somebody come out and tow them and bring them back to shore. And during that whole five days without power, that meant no refrigeration. And then food going back. That meant no ventilation. And then a lot of closed quarters on the inside, not smelling or feeling too good. And then water was moving in areas and toilets weren't working right. And then squishy things and smelly things and a generally not pleasant time for five days. People had to wait in line for hours for even just a, a bite of something to eat. It was not good. When they finally got to shore, people got off that boat, got on the ground and kissed the ground. They felt so much relief to finally be away from that five-day ordeal. But now imagine this. Imagine instead of being on a boat on the water, you're in the desert. Instead of being in a, a luxury cruise liner with access to mattresses and, and pillows and, and blankets, you're in the desert with nothing. I think about the rocks and the sand. And instead of having thousands of other passengers who could sympathize with you and, and encourage you in your struggle, you're surrounded only by wild animals. The only one talking to you is your greatest adversary who wants to break you. It's nothing more to see you fail your struggle. Imagine instead of just going five days without eating, you went 40. That's Jesus' time in the desert. That's his time right after that glory of baptism. He went out and struggled in the desert and faced Satan, which is Aramaic for adversary. This was his foe. This was the one that got Adam and Eve to sin and brought sin into the world. This is the one who wanted to see the whole world in hell with him. Now he is there battling Jesus, wanting to break this Messiah before the Messiah could break him. Now the other Gospels, uh, Matthew and Luke, give a little bit more details about this time in the desert. Now it says that during this 40 days, Jesus was constantly being tempted. But at the end of the 40 days, Matthew and Luke give a picture of a few specific temptations. But Mark doesn't do that. Mark, in general, is a little bit more of a sparse writer. He's a little bit more of a dramatic writer. He wants us to focus just here on the struggle itself. And that it was hard for Jesus in his human nature. Jesus was fully God, but also fully man. He hungered, he thirsted, he grew tired. This was such a struggle by, that by the end of it, he had the angels attending him encourage him, strengthen him again. This was a hard time that Jesus went through. Mark, Mark wants us to focus on this difficulty because it forces us to ask a very important question. Why did Jesus do it? Why did he struggle in the desert like that? Why go 40 days without eating? Why face the devil by himself like that? Why do it? Because you and I could never, ever go 40 days without giving in to temptation. You never could. The devil is our adversary too. He battles us all the time. But, but unlike Jesus, we don't just get attacked by the devil. We also get attacked within by our sinful nature. The sin that's always there. We give in so often. We have to, we have to agree with the writer of Psalm 130 who said... If you, O Lord, kept a record of our sins, Lord, who could stand? 
God kept track of all the times we've given into temptations. We would just slink away in shame. Who could stand up to that? It's because we don't even, we can't even talk about uh, withstanding the devil's attacks for 40 days. We can sometimes hardly withstand them for 40 seconds when a temptation, a pet temptation is put before us. We could never beat the devil. And it's important that, that we realize that that struggle is real. Maybe sometimes we feel a little bit more confident in ourselves than we should. And maybe, maybe it comes from not being honest with ourselves. Maybe sometimes we feel like the struggle with the devil isn't all that important. That maybe it's okay to just, instead of struggling and fighting the temptations, to just give in and find relief that way. Like the sin itself will give us relief. Or maybe it's sometimes easier to find relief in just feeling like we've already conquered all our sins and we've already got it so good, how could we get any better? But if that's how we find relief, really we're just finding relief in lies. And we're ignoring how real the struggle is. The Apostle Paul puts it like this when he warns us in 1 Corinthians. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. It's sometimes easy to forget how real and dangerous the struggle with sin is. Just a couple of days ago, a Dutch man in Sri Lanka found out how important it is to be aware of danger. Uh, he was on his honeymoon, and um, as he was trying to take a picture of his wife in Sri Lanka, they were at a very special geographical location called the World's End. Gorgeous area. A huge 4,000 foot cliff. Just a sheer drop straight down. Everybody goes and everybody wants to see it. And so this new husband wanted to take a picture of his new wife in the area. And as he was trying to adjust the camera and take a good picture, taking a good picture, he kept taking a step back, trying to zoom in and took another step back and another and off he went, the 4,000 foot cliff. Somebody wasn't taking seriously the danger around him. Now thankfully, this Dutch new husband became the first person to ever survive a fall off of there because only 130 feet down did he fall and get tangled up in a tree. This helicopter was able to come and rescue him. But do you want to imagine that conversation he had with his wife after that? <laughs> How stupid could you be? <laughs> Watch your surroundings. Take it seriously. This is a dangerous area. How stupid can we be? <coughs> Sometimes not take the devil and his tax seriously. Not take temptation seriously. Not take that struggle with sin seriously. Too often do we just get in the habit of giving in because, ah, it's just sin. You'll feel better if I do, if you'll feel better if I do. But all sin makes us fall short of the glory of God. No sin is okay. Sometimes as we get in the habit of avoiding the struggle with sin, it can even lead us to more and more sin. As we try to cover up past sins, as it leads us to new sins, and most dangerous of all, it can even lead us to the sin that eventually makes us forget about our Savior at all. We don't want to think that could ever happen to us, but if we don't take the struggle seriously, before we know what, off the cliff we could go. Leo Tolstoy, a uh, famous Russian author, struggled with Christianity a lot in his life, unfortunately, but here, I want to show you a quote where he really nailed the struggle with sin and the danger of sin right on the head in a really beautiful way. He said this, Each mistake, each sin, begins to bind us immediately the first time the bond is as thin as a spider web. If the sin is repeated, the spider web becomes a thread, then a string. If the sin continues to be repeated, it becomes a rope and, final, and a final chain. At first, sin is a stranger in your soul, then a friend. As soon as you get used to his presence, sin becomes the master of your soul. 
how true that is, is if we don't take the struggle of sin seriously, we can all of a sudden find it controlling our lives, taking over everything. That's why we look at the struggle in the desert with all seriousness. Because it's there, when we take the struggle seriously, that we do find real relief. Because it's there in the desert that we are reminded that the struggle with sin is so serious in God's eyes that he was willing to step into the struggle itself. To walk right into the hardships of it, the exhaustion of it, the pain of it. To do it on our behalf. We look in the desert and see how serious God takes the struggle. We find relief. Because it's there that we realize that Jesus already won the struggle. The writer of the Hebrews puts it like this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. Jesus knows the struggles that we go through because he went through them himself. He knows how serious and hard the struggle is, and that is why he went through it. That is why he went through it perfectly, because we couldn't beat the struggle, so he beat the struggle in our place. He was our substitute. He was our, our ram in the bush. He took our place when we needed it. And where's our relief? Our relief is right here. We'll see in a moment. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. Through Jesus' righteousness, through his perfect obedience, that is how you look in God's eyes now. As you struggle with sins in your life, you don't look like a failure in God's eyes through faith. Instead, since you're connected to Jesus through faith, you look like a conqueror. Just as Jesus conquered the devil in the desert, he didn't ever give in to temptations. That's how you look in God's eyes now. That's what we read about in, in our second lesson of today. We said that Jesus is our intercessor between us and, and God's judgment. As Jesus' intercessor, he doesn't, doesn't point down at us and say, oh, hey, Greg was, he was okay today, we'll let it go. No, instead he points at himself says that even though Greg has his struggles, even all of you have your struggles, I see my righteousness. My righteousness given to you. That's the relief of your struggle, is knowing that the struggle is already won. Jesus beat it in the desert. He left that desert. He kept struggling with every battle that the devil threw at him all the way to the cross. He beat that struggle forever. We know that because of the empty grave. That is the end of our struggle. The empty grave. It's a life forever. So don't be afraid of your struggle. Take it seriously. Understand that it's real, and that's an important to go through, that your temptations are, are hurtful. They're meant to be taken seriously, but know that you don't go it alone. You don't walk into your desert by yourself. Do you guys know actually one of the, the most important survival tips in the desert is reported by people who constantly have to rescue people in the desert? It's, it's not drinking water. It's not wearing sunscreen. The number one thing that they say, tell somebody you're going out in the desert. Talk to somebody. Bring somebody even with you if you can. Don't go it alone. You don't go into the desert alone. You don't have to. Remember that verse where we just looked at how Jesus knows the struggle that you go through and yet beat it? Look at this next verse. It reminds us of who we can go to with our struggles. It's the part in bold. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Your Savior knows your struggle. He knows every part of it. Go to him in prayer. Don't go in your desert by yourself. Don't face the struggle alone. He's there to give you mercy and grace that you need to make every step of your journey. In fact, he's probably going to put people in your lives to be there to help you, to keep you company, to encourage you, 
to remind you of how important this struggle it is, but also to remind you of how your struggle ends. That it ends in victory. That it ends with you being a conqueror in Christ. Take your struggle seriously. Because that way you find relief. That way you remember that God's holy throne is yours to go to whenever you need it. With whatever kind of struggle you're facing in life, your Savior knows what it's like. He's there to help you. Take his help seriously. Take the relief he offers seriously. The writer James puts it this way. This is our last verse for the day. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When you face your struggle, you take it seriously. Remember this. The struggle ends. But also remember this. The crown of life that you get at the end of it, the relief that Jesus won for you in the desert, cross, the empty grave, that belief never ends. It goes on forever. Take that promise seriously. Amen. Let's go to our God. Dear Jesus, thank you for being perfect when we could. Thank you for taking our punishment on the cross, a punishment we didn't want to take. Thank you for beating all our enemies with the empty grave. Help us to always face our struggles knowing that they are serious that you call us to face them and to stand up to them, which that you give us the power to do it, that in you all our struggles end with victory. In your name we pray. Amen.